Welcome to the parlor and to Canadian Thanksgiving weekend. Momentarily, I'll be procuring a 14-pound free-range turkey with stuffing, spuds, Brussels sprouts, carrots, vitamin G, gravy, little pumpkin pie and whipped cream. Maybe I should get some meatballs this year. Yes, this year, I am especially thankful on this wonderful Canadian holiday, which celebrates the harvest that Aston Villa Football Club not only captained, but extended our spiritual, emotional, vocal, physical, and on Thursday night, goal-scoring leader and hero, John the Meatball McGinn, whose goal, deep into stoppage time, which had an aura of the Watford win a couple of years ago at Villa Park. Remember the Mings and Konza one? Because of that goal, we are now in the very rare situation where all four teams in Europa Conference League Group E have the same games played, the same points, and even the same goal difference. It's a four-way tie for first and last. I'm going to try to make sense of it all because it was stressful and it was a slog. Aston Villa 1, Zielinski Moskar, nil. I've had to say it many times on this show before because we live in a world and a footballing echo chamber fueled by social media where a large amount of supporters actually believe that games should be playing out the way the FIFA franchise algorithms say they should or that they should somehow be dictated by the respective market values. Of each club, and that simply is not the case. It is an unscripted human drama played by real people on a real breathing grass pitch over 90 minutes, and it's why I love the sport so much and why it can give you the highest of highs and then a week later, the lowest of lows. Our opponents, the Bosnian champions, were not ashamed to admit that this was the biggest game in their club's history and they played like it. Incredibly disciplined, organized, well-drilled, fueled by the never-ending din, it seemed, of a quite remarkable traveling support when you think about the distance and also just the capacity of that club. I don't know if you know any Bosnians. I have a couple of Bosnian friends. I used to work with a Bosnian gal by the name of Vedrana Bekhailovic. and she terrified me. She was in finance too. I'm sure she made shivs in her office. Anyway, this was as good a performance as we've seen by any opponent come to Villa Park, even in the Premier League. That's how well-drilled they were. They had hearts the size of dump trucks. We knew it was going to be a slog. This is a team that came from 3-0 down at home to beat Alkmaar 4-3, which is incredible on its own. And we knew this was going to be a viper pit. Europa League Group E, but I don't know if we expected that which makes the result even that much more satisfying in some way. Bravo, Mostar. Bravo. It has been a while since Aston Villa participated in the group stages of European competition under the lights at Villa Park 13 years, if my memory is correct. And our regular correspondent, Samir Gaby, was there drinking it all in in his classic Henson circa 85 to 87 strip. I was at the tail end of high school during that time. Also, James Smith was there rolling the camera and staying warm by the pyrotechnics. Was a chilly night, but it did have the European feels with the away support, which was boisterous and impressive. As I welcome you officially to the Holy Trinity Show, named in honor of the original Trinity Road stand, which saw its fair share of European nights, but Trinity also means three. It's the three key issues or moments that defined Aston Villa 1, Mostar nil. There really was only one moment to talk about, but I'll give you some others in no particular order. And we'll start with the key numbers because I did actually get stats from this game. And as you can imagine, 
There was a discrepancy between the two teams, although we didn't do very well on expected goals, frankly, and we didn't even create a big chance officially, but look at our accurate passing. Shots on target. It took us 27 attempts to hit the target nine times. Okay, we scored in the end, but look at the clearances. 50 to 6. I don't know if I've ever seen that many clearances in one game. Big issue. Wouldn't it be amazing if any of our central defenders could hit the target with a header on an attacking set piece? Wouldn't that be something? There were a lot of those today. Our chief culprit was Diego Carlos, who I adore and I want so badly for this guy to get back to the way he was with Sevilla because it just hasn't been there for him since he's arrived with us. And I want him to be great for us. But Austin McPhee has some heading practice to work on at training tomorrow. Big moments. Two saves by Emmy Martinez. Oh, if we look back on the what-ifs of this game, what if Emmy Martinez hadn't come out and denied a wonderful opportunity in minute 15, which would have made this feel very Everton Carabao Cup-like, given the timing of that opportunity. Upon further reflection, I think that probably would have been called for offside on the initial ball over, as would the tip over the crossbar that he made in the 71st minute. In fact, I think it was given as offside, but he wasn't to know. I'm glad that Emmy Martinez was between the sticks for this one. I think he would have insisted upon it, but those two moments right there were big-time saves for a guy who was virtually a spectator for the rest of the match. Big issue, as it usually is, the lineup and the rotation. I read the inevitable meltdowns when Aston Villa's lineup was released and our very best squad wasn't named to this game because there are people who actually think that you should be able to play your best team every single game, even in three-game weeks, because you know what? FIFA players don't ever get tired. The problem with that approach, as I've said before, if you alienate your squad, you know what? They become jaded and they check out, and they're not ready when suspensions and injuries occur. So you must rotate and you must get the squad meaningful minutes. And my heart was warmed when I saw the team on the field that Nicolo Zaniolo was lined up in his preferred, either behind the striker role or wide right role or even better, somewhere in between because he wants to cut in on his left foot. Those are the areas of the park where he's had success in the past, and wouldn't you know it, he just seemed more engaged today, and the ball seemed to find him more today. So to have Den Donker get 45, Longley 90, Carlos 90, Tielemans 90, Zaniolo 90, Bailey 90, even a cameo from Bertrand Traore, that is so important for this group, especially with how the game turned out. Because you know, the wider squad would have been a bit jittery given what happened in Varsava and with the Carabao Cup exit to Everton. Not to mention, I'm sure, the technical staff was feeling a little bit anxious about getting these players involved because you've got to have options. You must have depth. And most importantly of all, you've got to have serious competition for places week in and week out on the training pitch. It wasn't perfect. It wasn't a Picasso. But all that matters at the end is that you have one more than they do when the final whistle sounds. I know you get bored of me talking about managing players' loads and their minutes because all supporters want is to win every game and every competition that's put before them, but the reality is, and Unai Emery has said it himself, the Premier League is the priority, and right now we are sitting in fifth place, a win out of first with a monstrous, and I mean monstrous, emotional game on Sunday at Molyneux. And if you get into the Champions League places via the Premier League, along with it comes, obviously, the television money of that competition, the exposure, the prestige, the sponsorships, the gate revenues, all of it. Do you know what you get if you go through the slog and get to the end of the Europa Conference League, apart from tired? You get a place in the Europa League.
And we're already sitting in that place in fifth right now. And that's why one of the most important substitutions on Thursday for me was at halftime when Cash came in for Dean. We've been relying on those players so much already. In my opinion, they've been excellent for us. And now they go into Sunday having only 45 minutes each under their belt in midweek. They should be fresh and ready to go 90 in that game on the weekend. I can't tell you how impressed I was with both of our fullbacks on Thursday because Luca Dean provided a lot of our attacking thrust down the left in that first half, but he also had a couple of really big defensive actions, including a sliding block that prevented a through ball that would have certainly led to a good chance. And then Cash, of course set up the game-winning goal. And it wasn't just that. He was involved in what felt like most of our really good opportunities in the second half. Where would we be without our two fullbacks right now? Because both of them have contributed heavily at both ends of the park this season so far without any cover whatsoever. Big moment. The penalty decision. Swiss referee Urs Schneider overturned it almost as quickly as he gave it. And the weird thing for me was the angle we were shown on the broadcast, because if that was the best angle that they were showing him on the monitor, it wasn't the best. There was a better angle, and we only got one little glimpse of it, at least on my feed. Anyway, penalty overturned, but had it been given with Douglas Louise on the pitch in the second half, it would have saved years worth of wrinkles and gray hairs on our heads. You know who else was at the game? Our future king, Paul Hansaker. The king of the job site, pictured here with Jerry O'Halloran, Sid Cowens, and Tony Morley. I think Paul actually puts in longer hours than the future king. And he's now on a three-game in-person winning streak. And remember, he missed the Everton Carabao Cup game because he's a perfectionist and he had to get some work done just outside of town. And I'm telling you, 24-7 is rocking right now. They've had more new jobs this year than Michael Beal. But now Paul's got some grafting to do and he's going to be at Wigan for some overnight stuff at the train station there. This is a massive project. This is what we call industrial. This is an eight-week job here. And these guys, his crew, these are... The Douglas Louise and Bubakar Kamara of the crew. This is some hard grafting. This isn't the fluffy stuff like Ollie Watkins and Musa Diaby where you, you paint a room in Aston Villa colors complete with gaslit lamp wall sconces, although 24-7 can do that as well. So if you've got a project, give them a dingle. Even if you are a dingle. Yes, they service Wolverhampton. And the number one, two, and three big moment that defined Aston Villa 1, Jorinsky Mostar nil, the McGinn miracle. Here's a great poll question. In fact, I'm running it on X right now. Which game 10 years from now will you remember more? 6-1 against Brighton or McGinn's last gasp winner in front of the Holt? in the Europa Conference League, because human psychology may suggest the latter. And that's because we had to suffer for 90 minutes. And when you have to suffer for 90 minutes, and then suddenly you are given a jolt of dopamine and adrenaline by watching a goal from a guy like McGinn at the death, somehow it becomes even that much more satisfying and indelible. And I would suggest as well, it may have implications for the players down the road too, because you know what? They're the ones who actually had to suffer for 90 minutes and never give up and never say, well, oh, it's not our day. And please don't tell me that you knew this was coming all along. I saw the social media posts. I saw the faces in the crowd. We threw everything at the whole 10 goal in the second half. The kitchen sink, the bathroom sink, the powder room sink, stainless steel, porcelain, clay. Nothing was getting through. And in the 94th minute, I was preparing to do a much different show than this one. And that's why the McGinn miracle will be etched into many of our minds for a very, very long time. When we're old and gray and we're reminiscing about Aston Villa, do you remember that time that the meatball sent a glancing header into the corner of the Holt goal, sending Villa Park into delirium 
and snatching victory from the jaws of a draw. As the time was slipping away like the sands through the hourglass, I was becoming increasingly more frustrated and ruining all the missed opportunities and lack of ruthlessness. Also the prowess of their goalkeeper who was their man of the match, but give some credit to their defenders as well. Nine blocks, 50 clearances. But what really irked me, and I think it irked Unai Emery as well, was the hopeless long bomb attempts from distance. And there were several culprits, including Douglas Louise, one from Zaniolo, but also two from Yuri Tielemans. And the second of those was with so many players wide open on the right-hand side of the penalty box where the goal eventually came from. I was actually inventing new swear words that my kids were learning, like, <coughs> and in that split second, after 90-plus jersey-drenching yards in which McGinn was employed like a Swiss army knife, plugged into all sorts of different holes around the field, our captain, our skipper, the meatball, Mr. Aston Villa, delivered the goods. On Saturday, he was the setup guy. Three sublime balls that led to goals. And on this occasion, he was the hero. He was the goal-getter with Matt Cash playing the role as wingman and setup guy. Time stood still in that moment when the ball came across and then glanced off the meatball's noggin. Because when you watch it on TV, you don't know, is that ball going wide? Is the goalkeeper going to save it? And it ends up going right into the corner of the net. And at that moment, Group E changed dramatically. I just hope that John McGinn has something left in the tank, not only for Sunday, but you know he's going to be relied on heavily for Scotland during the international break, and that worries me a little bit. The bottom line, and all that matters here, is that we are still in it, because I have a difficult time believing that we could have any chance of topping this group with just one point from the first two rounds. So these next two games against Alkmaar could very well decide this group. And they're no slouch. They were put to the test by Legia in Amsterdam, a game that turned ugly, by the way. And I wonder if there'll be implications to that. But we did exactly what Unai Emery said we had to do, win this game. Are we shocked that this man has guided us to another victory when we needed it the most. And so we huffed and we puffed and eventually we finally dispatched one team wearing gold and black this week. And on Sunday, we'll try to do it all over again. Only that team wearing gold and black is a completely different animal. Well, yeah, they're, they're wolves. And for some reason, they seem to have our number in the same way we have Brighton and Hove Albion's number, which is just weird. And they're coming off an incredible performance and result, a 2-1 win over the rodri -less Manchester City, but take nothing away. Full value to hand the champions their first loss of the season. Now, I said after Brighton, to win a game like that, in that manner, only to then a week later lay a stinker at Molyneux, would somehow undermine that performance. And a lot of people said we did lay a stinker at Molyneux last season. I disagree. I thought statistically we were the better team by far. The difference was they had one moment. We did not. And I'll be very curious to see if we have the squad that can take us there and reverse that this season. Now, based on Thursday's rotations, I think we can make some pretty safe assumptions as to who is starting on Sunday at Molyneux, starting with Emmy Martinez, Pau and Konza, Dean and Cash, Douglas Louise, of course. John McGinn's not going to say no, even though he went 90 minutes, and Ollie Watkins. After that, though, it comes down to the extent of the injuries. And I'm starting to wonder... And this is just a hunch, but I wonder if Unai Emery and his staff are starting to become a little bit more cagey with their injury declarations. And I only say that because of Leon Bailey. I mean, a week ago, it felt like Leon Bailey was going to be out until after the international break. And lo and behold, he shows up at the training. He starts on Thursday and goes the 90 minutes. So what about Jacob Ramsey? There were rumors that he might have re-injured the metatarsal problem. No confirmation from the club. One of the side effects of that injury, by the way, is lingering pain, which you do have to manage. And by the way, 
You use your feet as a footballer. No word either on Musa Diaby, but I have this sneaking suspicion somehow that all three will show up. It was also interesting that Douglas Louise replaced Leander Den Donker at halftime because if Bubakar Kamara can't go on Sunday, are you going to play Yuri Tielemans, who just went 90 minutes on Thursday, or a guy who played 45, is a little bit more defensive as a midfielder and is a former Wolves player? And also keep in mind that Bailey and Zaniolo each went 90 minutes on Thursday. Big decisions and hopefully healthy players on the horizon for the weekend. I'm telling you, we are closing in on the quarter pole of the season. This is match week eight already, and we are within touching distance of first place. And can you imagine, even though our squad is kind of battered a little bit right now, and coming off two very different kinds of victories, both confidence and morale boosting. But if we could go to Molyneux and end that hoodoo and pick up three points heading into an international break, and I hate international breaks, but this time we probably need a little bit of rest, recuperation, and recovery time. Oh my goodness. There'll be so much to look forward to. Until the trip to the black country, be well. Happy Canadian Thanksgiving. Breathe. And as always, up the mighty villa. <laughs> <laughs>